Welcome to the Intimate Marriage Podcast, where I teach educated, successful couples how to have incredible, passionate relationships so that you can stop compromising and start feeling fully alive in your relationship. I'm Alexandra Stockwell, aka The Intimacy Doctor. I'm a physician, a relationship and intimacy coach, and I'm an intimate marriage expert. My husband and I have been married for 26 years. We have four children and full professional lives, and we've created an amazing marriage. I've shown hundreds of couples how to do so as well. So if you want to deepen your understanding of your own relationship and learn to access new heights of emotional, sensual, and erotic intimacy, you're in the right place. I will show you how. Now, let's dive in. Today is a celebration. It's a celebration of many different things, and I'm glad you're here to participate. This is the 100th episode of the Intimate Marriage Podcast, and I have decided to celebrate by inviting my own coach to join me in this conversation. My coach is Anne Rose Hart. We'll put her website a link in the show notes. I want to tell you why I chose to be her client, why I chose to have her guide me, and also why I invited her onto today's episode. So first of all, there's so many different things that you could know about Anne, but the one I'm going to tell you is that she is a wing walker. I'm going to assume you don't know what that is, as I didn't. That means that with the right outfit, she stands on the wings of planes while the pilot flies them in the sky. So get this, right? That means she has to understand physics and very specific micro adjustments And she also has this incredible global kind of eagle's eye view of what is happening. And both of those qualities are brought to the coaching she gives me. And you'll probably hear that in this conversation. And I've invited her to interview me today because I want you to know what it means to me to be celebrating my 100th episode of the Intimate Marriage Podcast, what it means in terms of my podcast, what it means in terms of my mission and the ways that I want to serve you in having more intimacy, more connection, more self-expression, more gratification, and more pleasure and ease in your life. So with that, I'm handing the proverbial baton to my coach, Anne. Welcome and thank you. (laughs) Oh, thank you so much for for today and the wonderful opportunity to play with you in this space. I I love the introduction that you brought forward. Thank you for that. But mostly what I love about it is how it so beautifully mirrors your own genius and your own capacities that I'd never thought of in those terms before. We've never thought about wing walking in your context, but there's a way in which you bring a kind of a parallel to this conversation of intimacy and relationships, which is the bird's eye view from the air in which you see the big picture. When a couple comes into your world, there's a relationship in front of you. You see the big picture of what's going on. And then the micro movements and the tiny adjustments that must be made to stay in flight without falling off the wing of the plane in your marriage, right? (laughs) And you have such a gift for holding both that big picture as well as very specific and precise suggestions and perspectives that just blow things open for the people that are, are, are honored to be in your presence and to work with you. So I want to start with that because, you know, often we have our own preconceived ideas of what is intimacy. And if you say, oh, I'm an intimacy coach or mentor, 
everyone's going to have their own view of what that actually means. For some, it's sexual. For some, it's emotional. For some, it's cuddling. You know, everyone just has their own lens. And yet you hold this broad spectrum of what actually goes into intimacy. So I'd like to throw that out there is, is our opening uh, portal into the conversation. What, how do you see intimacy? Like we're on the Intimate Marriage Podcast, but what really is intimacy if we see it through the lens of Dr. Alexandra Stockwell? I think of intimacy as an experience of connectedness, an experience of connection, but also of connectedness. And what I mean by that is that so often in relationships, an individual tends to go in one of two directions. The one direction is to be so oriented to the partner's experience, so oriented whether it's during sex and I'm thinking about how it's going to feel to him if I touch him this way, or how it's going to feel to him if he touches me this way. But the point is that the attention is really on the other person. And then there's the other option, which it's very trendy now to call people narcissistic. Some people really are, many are not, but it's a way to point to a kind of selfishness and a self-centeredness where such a person is really just focused on their own experience and letting that impact be whatever it is on other people. Those are in many ways the two the two things that intimacy is not in the middle there balancing as i imagine you do on the wing of a plane let's be clear this is purely imagination for me <laughs> it it was kind of expansive enough to just see photographs of you <laughs> on the plane in the air that was as far as i go with that but when it comes to intimacy it really is an art to have attention fully deeply and honestly on oneself and on another person and when that happens there's something else that emerges that unfortunately we really don't have english words to describe i don't know that any other language has the vocabulary but it's a lived experience that it reminds me a little bit of when people are singing together and as the song ends there's that pause before the applause begins that's a form of intimacy or the experience in an incredible orgasm where suddenly you open your eyes and remember there's somebody else there too even though you have felt that other person there the whole time and i really do think of the experience of intimacy as an art however it has absolutely been my pleasure to become very scientific about it meaning have step-by-step -step instructions because the kinds of experiences that I'm describing are actually learnable with clear, simple, welcoming instruction. Yeah, I'm pausing because I'm taking in everything you just shared. And I am noticing within myself, as you speak about intimacy, you almost radiate a force field of intimacy <laughs> that I, I'm having a palpable experience of sensing a softening and an invitation to presence inside of me. At the same time, I'm hearing your words. I'm with you in the conversation. So there's kind of a dual level of awareness that makes being with you, for me, so delicious. and. As you say, intimacy is a learnable skill, but this, it's not presence, it's not mindfulness, it's, it, you know, I don't know what we want to call it, 
but there's a way in which you help the people that are coming into your world develop this capacity to have their attention on themselves and the other simultaneously. And I'm just wondering what, what is that like? Because I know you, there's kind of a trajectory that, that people go on when they come into your work that helps them develop this skill that you have experimented with for years and years, decades in your own marriage. So how would you describe this trajectory that people go on as they're developing this particular capacity? Well, when a couple first reaches out through my website or through social media, invariably what each of them is aware of is the way that their partner isn't adequate for them, we'll just say. Not, not across the board, but in whatever realm it matters, that the quality of attention or the open-mindedness or just the attention. Now, some of the time, individuals are aware of their own limitations and restrictions as well. But almost all of the time, they're aware of their partner's restrictions and limitations and inadequacies. That is a perfectly fine place to start. That is human nature. For a couple that really wants transformation, they're not just looking to dip their toes in or get a sense of what's possible, but they really are ready to transform the culture of their marriage into one that is defined and enhanced through intimacy, intimacy in the bedroom, intimacy at the dinner table, intimacy with logistics, just all of life can have more flavor to it. For such a couple coming in the way I've described, aware of what they want their partner to do differently, and sometimes what they want themselves to do differently, the first step really is for each of them to put attention on their own experience. This is actually more nuanced and profound than people anticipate. Because when you live with someone and you've built a life with them, you are aware of how things are for them, whether you're scared of them or you're nurturing them and accommodating them, you know, whatever it is, you're aware of how it is for the other person. And there always are various hmm, beliefs, prior conditioning, shoulds from some book they've read, uncertainty, whatever it is that each in their own way makes it actually quite challenging for an individual to bring their attention and energy back to focusing on their own experience in a way that isn't disconnecting, it isn't selfish, but it is wholesome and self-oriented. In fact, my colleague, Dr. Kate Mangona, uses the word interdependence in a way that I really love. I think we're familiar with codependence, we're familiar with independence, but there's a way in which it is essential to be interdependent in putting attention on oneself and accessing a new spaciousness and often creativity and self-awareness, joy in doing that. So that's the next phase. And as I'm hearing you speak about this, it strikes me that a person or a couple who is ready to engage in this type of conversation is at some level asking different questions in their life beyond who's going to pick up the kids from school today or, you know, what are we doing Saturday night at seven because well, we've got this going on. Like there is something that must be alive within a couple or at least at least more dominantly one person in the couple, and then it, it can translate into both. But what is it that is alive 
that is a question in their heart that guides them into this conversation where you hold such magnificent space for so many nuances of transformation. Can you identify what the question is that's alive within somebody's heart? It's a very interesting question that you ask because a lot of the couples that I coach have never worked with a therapist or a coach before because they are not looking for an outside authority to give them answers. They're definitely not looking for a referee and they're not looking to wallow in what isn't working. And so often the reason that they reach out is they hear one or both of them hear me talk or read my book and there's a new kind of hope that emerges that something is actually possible because a lot of the couples that I coach, they have good, solid relationships. They typically have people who look up to them and admire their marriage or committed relationship, but they know that there's a lot more that's possible, that there's a way in which things can be more alive, more connected, or as I would say, more intimate. And so the first thing in their heart is hope. Now, another thing in their heart is a new, well, maybe a long-standing craving, but a new possibility, a new awareness of being fully self-expressed and connected. Because we just as humans run this either or paradigm so deeply, there's a way in which most of what I've said so far reflects that phenomenon. And when I'm coaching ambitious, successful couples who really know how to be extraordinary in many areas of their life and want to be able to within the context of their marriage, well, yeah, that's what we're talking about. It's fascinating to me, too, because it's something I witness consistently, and it's also been an element I've witnessed in my own experience, where in other aspects of life, you could be fully expressed, you can be, you know, fully just being who you really are. And then in relationship, there's this strange phenomenon, a perceptual filter that drops into place that says, ah, but if I let this person see this part of me or let them know that this is not working for me. Somehow there's a lot at stake and I can't be authentic and open about that. And there's so much that goes into the simplest thing about simply identifying what you want, saying what that is and articulating it in a way that your partner can hear you. And it, it would think it would be so simple because it's just those steps. What am I sensing? What do I want? How can I communicate that? And how do I know my partner well enough to communicate in a way that they can hear me? But for whatever reason, our human nature is such that that's really complicated. And you have this gift of being able to see all sorts of cultural variables and backgrounds and contexts that are informing the conversation without either party recognizing it or subtle nuances in body language or where they're holding themselves in tension rather than ease. You just have this bird's eye view that then lets you identify very specifically a place where there's some something bound up that can soften and allow this connection between people. And I'm wondering, you know, you, this is clearly a, a a part of your genius and your gifts and your talents that you've cultivated over a lifetime. But with the couples that you work with, they are developing this capacity as well. We can call it self-awareness or self-referential observation or, you know, but there's some way in which you hold attention in a way that allows other people to have their attention on these subtleties in different ways. So all of that said, yeah, I, I will respond to that because the couples that I'm coaching in 
solid, long-lasting relationships are not used to having a third person be part of their conversations. Right. They're, you know, couples on the verge of divorce, one or both are often complaining and, you know, speaking ill of the situation. When someone is dating, they are very comfortable talking about their partner and what's going on. But when you're committed, it's very vulnerable and complicated to let anybody else know what's going on, especially because if you have a long lasting relationship, then there's the idea that if you've been together for five years, 10 years, 20 years, you should know what you're doing. And there can be shame in having uncertainty and other feelings. So first of all, it's a very big deal for someone to choose to welcome a third person into that dynamic. And I think one of the things that I really benefit from in terms of being a physician is that I have decades of experience knowing how to have conversations with people about very, about very personal matters where I need to know what's happening. And it's very clear to both of us that it has nothing to actually do with me. This is something that is different with with people who are intimacy or sex coaches who don't have a kind of clinical professionalism, then it can sometimes feel a little mixed up the energies. And so there's a way in which I can be in very intimate conversations with people in a loving, connected, and extremely boundaried and warm way. So that is the context that I want to say because when I complete coaching clients, which is always an exciting thing because I want to be teaching clients how to be with themselves and one another in ways that last for all of life. I I can't count how many couples I've coached where when I met them, they said, yeah, we worked with a therapist and it helped for a little while. Like I never want to be putting my attention into something that helps for a little while. So in creating lasting results, I, to be honest and in integrity with myself at the end of coaching, always or often ask couples, you know, what was helpful in what we've just done together. And it used to surprise me. It no longer does because it happens so often. But at least one of them, and sometimes both, will say, I benefited so much from the modeling that you, Alexandra, did and how you interacted with my spouse. Because mm -hmm. while there's all of life to live with your partner, with your spouse, the fact is that we get into habits in how we communicate and we become less creative in introducing variety. And so if let's say a woman is critical of her husband and she sees me hear the exact same thing that she hears. And I'm not enabling, I'm not ignoring, I'm taking it in fully with acceptance and meeting him there. And then being met there, he has the possibility of shifting and growing into a new way of being. She sees that once and she doesn't forget it. And similarly, let's say a woman who tends to be more private and quiet and not so critical, when her husband, because I'm mostly coaching heteronormative couples, when her husband hears how I just gently slow down, slow my pace, soften the volume and ask her to share, then she opens up. And sometimes a spouse feels a little offended when someone opens up when I'm there and they haven't opened up themselves. 
But they get over that soon because magic happens when both people are actually expressing themselves. And while, yes, I'm a doctor, I'm a coach, a lot of what I'm doing is actually what a teacher does. Right, right. And this, I want to circle back to the very first thing when I asked you about intimacy, and you said intimacy is an experience of connectedness. And what you're just describing is the thing that you, I'll say you do it intuitively, but I know you've developed it over decades of practice and focus as well. But there's a way in which the skill set that you are teaching is how to pay attention to the point of connection within oneself, the point of connection with the other person and the space between. And it's simply learning to look through a different lens that looks at an experience in a different way. And that creates an experience of connectedness that impacts every aspect of the relationship. And you have such a beautiful, nuanced uh, methodology that helps people learn these very specific ways of observing and interacting with whatever content is arising in the moment. And this changes everything in a relationship. Would you agree? Yes. And I have to say that one of the things I enjoy that really is a playground for me is that when you don't have intimacy or not as much or not the kind of intimacy you want with your partner, it can feel extremely mysterious. But in that mystery, there are patterns that I recognize. There are very simple adjustments to be made. There is a step-by-step -step approach to be taken. And when you do, then that mystery, it still has mystery and magic, but it is no longer mysterious. And honestly, despite all of the different kinds of training I've done, this particular way of breaking things down into accessible, actionable, clear steps, I fully attribute to the excruciating experience of interacting with my husband when I had an ease in communication and he didn't. And he would always say to me, I just wish there were a manual. I wish there was a manual for interacting with all women, but especially with you. And <laughs> the first time he said it, I just thought it was a joke, but I came to understand that it was actually a very literal desire. And these things that for me, I had first of all thought were obvious. And second of all, thought he should just get my nuance. You know, if I I raise my shoulder a little bit. He should know that means that I'm, I've had a hard day and I'm sad and he should hug me, but my face is just the same. And he would miss all these clues that I didn't even realize I was giving until I started to pay attention. But what I really want to say is that I had to accept that if I wanted to reach him in the way that I could tell was possible, I needed to get over myself and wanting it to be so nuanced and fluid and actually express what it takes. And now he's an intuitive natural, like I don't communicate with him that way anymore. But in the process, I learned how to essentially translate emotional intelligence to a Harvard scientist. And here we are. I'm so grateful for how annoying that for not that it was annoying, but that I went through that annoying experience yeah. because like I have such a full heart for intelligent, competent people who know how to do well in their business, in their career, in school whether it's a lot of academic education or not, like my heart goes out to you when you know how to handle yourself, except when it comes to intimacy. And so I really mm -hmm. love providing the, the teaching on how to create intimacy 
in a love language that smart, successful people can connect mm -hmm. with. Absolutely. And it's one of your most tremendous gifts and blessings to all of us that you had that intrinsic drive for all these years that wanted to figure out how to get your marriage to work with your own husband, because you then applied your own lens as a scientist yourself, as a medical doctor, to assess and evaluate, okay, here's the challenge. Here's where we're not connecting properly. What do I need to be aware of within myself? What do I need to be aware of within him? And how do I need to communicate that for so how this works? And this from this lived experience has come this profound methodology. And in the the tiny bit of interaction that I've I've been blessed to have with your children, I am just blown away by the ripple effect of seeing children raised in an environment where this way of relating is normal because your children have such an extraordinary capacity for their own self-awareness, their own healthy capacity to communicate. It's clearly next level parenting that becomes a side effect of this work that really has the the potential to alter how we function collectively if more and more parents and more and more spouses and more and more children are exposed to these tools there's a lot of hope for a lot of the things that are major challenges for us in our world right now so that said i'd love I to i just want to say that yeah. i'm so touched by what you've just said because i was remembering when I had two young children, realizing that so many people go to therapy or counselors or coaches to heal what happens in childhood, I really want wanted to be able to provide preventative medicine. I'm, I'm all for my yes. children going to therapists and coaches, but anything that I could attend to in myself and how my husband and I interact with one another and how we interact with our children, anything we could do up front yes. was just a no brainer to prioritize. Right. I love the way you language that as preventative medicine. Absolutely. It absolutely is. You have the healthiest ecosystem as a family with your four beautiful children who are so emotionally mature and wise beyond their years. It's truly, truly an honor to witness. So all of that said, what I was wanting to bring forward is the bigger picture of this work for you Obviously, the, the immediate application is for couples in committed relationships to deepen intimacy. But if more and more couples do this work and learn the methodology and learn these skills that you offer, what's possible for us, for all of us? Where do you see this going? Best case scenario. I love this question on the 100th episode of the Intimate Marriage Podcast. I suddenly have a vision for what am I going to be talking about when I'm doing the 1000th episode of the Internet right. Marriage Podcast? Like what will have happened between now and then? And I think the simplest way to put it is that by and large, the most common relationship advice that is given is that if you want a great marriage, you need to learn to compromise. And if you're new to the Intimate Marriage Podcast, please listen to my episode on uncompromising intimacy because compromise just doesn't work. And so my big dream is that whether or not some people are compromising is that throughout the world, people have an understanding that self-expression, connectedness, authenticity, vitality, vulnerability, passion, and truly being connected with oneself and one's partner are actually the way to have a great marriage whatever that means to you yeah and i would i would second that and say great marriage great sex great family great workplace 
great community, great world, like the foundational skills that you are bringing forward are the relational skills that are, from my perspective, required for all of us to navigate so many bigger challenges that we're dealing with at, at a societal level, because everything ultimately comes down to how can we relate with each other in a way that creates connectedness. And this is your specialty, your genius, your skill set. And we're just so blessed that you've done this work. I love that you've brought that in because the whole thing in really up leveling your relationship is that that is an outstanding benefit unto itself. Like that is enough motivation to really up level your relationship so that you get to enjoy experiencing an up leveled relationship. However, it also, with all kinds of different parameters, is better for your health and longevity. It is better for your income. It is better for your familial relationships. It is better for literally every interaction you have with another human being. And so while <laughs> I have this new image, maybe because I'm talking to a wing walker, that there's a way in which focusing on your relationship is both like training wheels for the rest of life and mountain biking simultaneously. <laughs> like it is the real thing with all of the erotic, ecstatic, tender gratification, and it provides all of the tools for everything else to be emotionally mature and uplifting. Absolutely. I love that analogy. And I'm just realizing we've been exploring this at kind of a high bird's eye view level. We haven't even got to the juicy nitty gritty of the translation of these practical skills that you teach into how this creates really hot juicy erotic intimacy and the aliveness of life force that emerges for couples who have put in this foundational work the very natural expression of that physically and sexually i think maybe we'll leave that for a whole other episode where we can just dive into that and light the fire that sounds perfect <laughs> a little bit of uh <laughs> mm, that sounds like just the way to approach that topic <laughs> Well, it's like I often hear you say, when you've done this level of work with the the tools and methods that you provide, everything becomes foreplay. And so here we are. Everything is foreplay. We'll leave it on a teasing note and I'll turn it back over to you and we'll bring it to completion. Thank you so much, Anne. It actually feels kind of tender and intimate to take our private coaching conversations to the airwaves. And I'm so grateful that you've joined me for this celebration. It's been my pleasure and I look forward to doing it again. If you enjoyed this episode, share it with a friend and please leave a rating and a review. And if you're ready to deepen your relationship and create a truly intimate, delicious, and vibrant marriage, head over to the Work With Me page at alexandrastockwell.com and choose the program that's right for you.